What's up everybody, Griffey here. I am ecstatic for season two of House of the Dragon on HBO. Now, I thought in preparation for our return to Westeros for season two, it would be awesome to go back, watch season one, and discuss what I noticed and learned on a rewatch. We serve at your pleasure, King Bran the Broken, ruler of the six kingdoms and protector of the realm. So it's impossible to talk about House of the Dragon, or as we call it around here, Hot D, without a little bit of refresher and going back to the past, right? Very much like the show. The failures of the Game of Thrones finale were so many and painful, it's hard to even describe, right? As we used to go through week to week, who will sit on the Iron Throne? Um, no one on planet Earth was waving flag brand. No one was excited for that. He's a crow who sees stuff, but it never matters or helps. He's just kind of a snarky little occasionally. The turn of Daenerys, right? Her whole theory is she's going to break the wheel. I will not be like my father, the Mad King. I'm gonna fix stuff around here. At the end, the lady who does her laundry and chats with her gets pushes off the wall and she goes, that's it. I'm gonna kill everyone except for the people that hurt me and caused all this. And we just let Arya kill the Night King. Like the Night King doesn't have the ability to defend himself from a basic dagger drop. I think it's fair to say, at bare minimum, HBO's Game of Thrones uh, finale left a lot to be desired. So, HBO's House of the Dragon, right, the prequel and follow-up at the same time, had a big monumental task ahead of it to bring the fans back and not disappoint. It is to begin with a terrible winter gusting out of the distant north. Essentially, season one is a tale of two stories, right? The first half of the story being King Viserys and Prince Daemon and their kind of paths and in relationship to this throne and lineage question. Part two becomes about Princess Rhaenyra and Queen Alicent and the struggles they'll carry forth. So immediately, this, this kind of fighting over who gets to sit on the throne is a very common and, and perpetual theme of Game of Thrones, right? What I love about the start of this Game of Thrones is that there is not all of the immediate tumult of who's gonna be, what's this. The regime is kind of set. There is a solidarity and a steadiness to the world of Westeros that we really haven't seen on the show before. King Viserys might be the first time that we've spent an inordinate amount of time with an actual good man sitting on the throne. We had a little bit in Game of Thrones and then his mom blows up a church and he does a nosedive. We see the ideals of a man, right? Who believes that through studying history and being a good steward and a good man, he can help this, this reign, this peaceful reign, 100 years of the dragon into the future. But we see that fate is always cruel in Game of Thrones, right? That because he can't have a son, right? So even though he has a daughter who is perfectly capable, because she's not packing, that's not enough. We see the realm use that simple act of biology. So we watch King Viserys struggle mightily. And in one of the most crushing decisions we've ever seen in Game of Thrones early in the show, he's forced to choose between his wife, who he loves dearly, and the possibility of having a son, which leads to a horrifying surgery moment. So that moment feels very much like Game of Thrones, right? Royalty and, and nobility making terrible decisions to continue to propagate their power. In fact, the device of the season becomes watching the throne cut King Viserys. We are watching the, the weight and just the, the fact and attraction of this chair kill him by a thousand cuts over the course of the show. I think King Viserys immediately become, the performance is wonderful, but it's immediately one of the best character arcs that we've ever had in Game of Thrones. So that at the core of House of the Dragons is very, very valuable. Now, you and I both own a small piece of our ancestry. You then pair that with our, our kind of new super heartthrob, right? Matt Smith as Prince Damon. I mean, this is the new role that will be the top line of his story. So Damon comes in and he is nobility unleashed as we are more familiar with in Thrones, right? He's out just plowing at brothels, riding giant dragons, killing people with swords. This guy has no barriers, but he's the second son. And when the young prince dies, right, he calls him the prince for a day. This sets up a huge feud with his brother. Damon's sent away. Damon's arc then becomes the battle with the crab feeder. Now the crab feeder is cool as hell, right? And it becomes this long protracted battle. Watching uh, Matt Smith's Damon charge through, slaughter, slaughter, taking arrows, 
oh, the sea snake and his army's coming. Oh, the dragon's coming. We know everything that's gonna happen. That scene is so cool and confident, they don't even show Damon in the crab feeder meeting. He carries the top half of the crab feeder back out onto the battle like he's trash. Viserys is back in the capital, right? Trying to bang his young teenage bride. And fortify the line while calling his daughter the heir. So this gets into that kind of classic Game of Thrones feel that we're used to. Before we get on, <laughs> I just gotta say, Game of Thrones, can we stop with the young incest? Like, it's not the greatest thing, right? Watching Damon just drag Renea into the brothel, start it up and then say peace. Um, I don't know contextually what that was supposed to do. It does end up mattering a lot at the end of the show, but damn. <laughs> I don't know where, what was I talking about? One of the things that is somewhat startling and jarring in the show are the time jumps, right? The biggest one being between episode five and six, where we jump about 10 years. All of a sudden, Rhaenyra's got little non-blonde haired bastards running around everywhere. The queen is all of a sudden really mean, but if you back that up, I think one of the things the show does exceptionally well, right? So we have an actress who plays young Renea, who is one of my favorite actors in the whole show. Her and her friend, um, young Allison, right? Their kind of journey as, as best friends into, ew, gross, you're banging my dad, who's four times our age. And them kind of fighting, but they never lose the sense that they actually really love each other. And I think one of the things the show does well is marrying these two performances through the decades. When we do the time jump, the, the older actresses do a great job of keeping those battle lines that are already drawn. All of the lines that they say to each other take on even more hidden meaning. They're more cutting until they start actually cutting each other. The second half of the season becomes these two's collision course, eventually ending in an actual like knife to each other's throat scene. It feels organic, it feels real. It's actually an incredible feat that the show pulls off that it's not more jarring every time we get new actors. It just feels like somehow HBO built a time machine, which they should have used to fix Game of Thrones, but now they're using it to make Hot D better. So we have dragons galore on this show. This show is the first time we actually see two dragons engage in open battle. When Amon is chasing his little cousin uh, away from Storm's End, this actually plays like a horror movie scene. When we watch this boy trying to be brave, trying to do the, the right thing, yell Dracarys and try to flame his cousin's dragon out of the sky, we watch the big dragon destroy the smaller dragon and by proxy his smaller cousin. That was a really cool moment. It felt like something that we had not seen in that style yet on Game of Thrones, right? Like this show still has its exact pulse on the kind of big moments it needs to deliver while usually deferring to kind of smaller and more nuanced moments. In the second half of the season, that math starts to tip more towards badass moments. And so I think if you're going to make a show, that's how you do it, right? You ramp up as you go. You don't show us the at the start and then put on more clothes as you go. That's not how math works. That's not how anything works. It's probably the greatest power of the show is how invested they get us in these characters and how well they use those in-between big-ass dragon moments to really pull us in deep to what is essentially just a family drama. The war be fought. Many will die. The boundaries for war are set. Damon's coming for everybody. We understand that. Um, does it seem like Prince Amon can ever have a normal, healthy life again? Does it seem like maybe his only titillation in life is now murdering cousins and everyone around him? Yeah. It feels like this season especially will be following a more traditional Game of Thrones path. So we will see parents die, kids die, and the people who were remaining will continue the fight. And if I'm lucky, I'll get to see Otto Hightower murdered in a horrible, horrible, beautiful Game of Thrones style death. There are other characters I've hated, but I think Joffrey and Otto Hightower might be my two least favorite. So that's another thing I'm hoping for in season two is to just watch him horrifyingly murdered in front of his friends and family, which is, you know, one of the nice things Game of Thrones gives us. So that's our rewatch of season one. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope that you're prepared for more dragons, more incest, and more fighting over a big metal chair June 16th on HBO.